our Sunday school lesson this week, the first lesson of 2024, it is a good follow-up to what we saw in our Sunday school lesson last week in Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, where Paul, he wrote to those who are in the church of Ephesus that all can be saved. He essentially was saying that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Everyone has been chosen by the Lord. Everyone has been called by God. The sad thing is, is that only a few of us have picked up that call. Only a few of us have been attentive to that call. In a follow-up of that lesson, we see here in Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus this week, that Paul, he speaks about how God molds the sincere believer to work to produce the righteousness of the Lord. We'll see here, there in the first verse, there in the second chapter of Ephesians, that Paul, he states, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, the you there that Paul is speaking to is again talking about all of those who made up the church of Ephesians, all of those specifically speaking, those who were of sincere faith. Paul is speaking to those who have been attentive to the rebuke of God, to all of those who are living in repentance. So I want you to understand that he's not only talking to those who are of that church, but he's talking to all of us today who are of sincere faith. We must remember that all of us, we were once dead in our trespasses against the Lord. That is our offenses against God. We transgressed. We, we lived in disobedience to the way of God. We lived in opposition. We'll see Paul speak more on it there in the second verse where Paul, he tells us that we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who, know, who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, does any of us have any idea who it is that Paul is referencing there in that scripture? Who is it that Paul is saying is the prince of the power of the air? Who is it that Paul is saying is the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience? I want you to understand today that Paul, in making that statement, he's talking about Satan. Satan is the prince of this world. He, he dwells in this world. Now, does that mean that, that he has power over this world? Does that mean that, that he has power over the Lord? Does that mean that he's equal to God? The reason why I ask those questions is because many people try to put the devil on the same plane, the same level as the Lord. I want you to understand today that the devil is not equal to God. He was created. He was made by the Lord along with all of the other angels. In fact, when you turn over to the first chapter of Job, when the sons of God, when they reported to the Lord, I want you to understand in that scripture, the sons of God is, is referring to the angels. In that scripture, you'll see that Satan was right there fouling in line with the other angels to give a report. And when he gave his report, he told the Lord that he, he was busy going to and fro in the world. Satan, he was looking to see who he could consume, who he could devour, who he could deceive, just as he did when he was in the garden to show you that he does not have power over the Lord. When, when Satan wanted to test Job, guess what he had to do? He had to go and he had to ask God for permission. And the Lord permitted Satan to, to do what it was that he did. But the Lord forbid him from doing anything to, to bring harm to Job's soul. Again, Satan, I want you to understand, he is not on equal level. He's not on the same plane as the Lord. Yes, he is a prince in this world. It's shown to us also in the book of Daniel when the angel was trying to bring a message to Daniel and Satan held up the angel. But again, he does not have power over the Lord. The Lord, I want you to understand that he is sovereign. He is the one that, that rules over all things, both those things that are known in this creation, those things that are unknown to us as well. We'll see there as we continue on in the third verse, we'll see Paul, he, he talks about the days 
of how we lived when, when we lived according to the course of this world. Uh, we, we conducted ourselves, Paul said, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind. Paul will see that he also states that we were by nature, I want you to understand, that's talking about the nature of sin. Paul says that we were children of wrath. Now, I want you to notice there in, in that manner of living, that manner of living is not of God's workmanship, is it? That's what we're looking at in our Sunday school lesson today, God's workmanship. No, living in that manner, living according to the flesh, living according to the course of this world, living as the sons of disobedience, the spirit of disobedience that works in the sons of disobedience, we said is Satan. So living in that manner, would that not be Satan's workmanship? When you, when you desire to fulfill the lust of your flesh, when you transgress against God, I want you to understand that you're living according to the way of Satan, who is the father of sins. You are Satan's workmanship. So Paul, he points out here in the fourth verse that this work cannot produce anything that is holy and righteous, can it? which is why again, the Lord needed to transform us from, from being that sinful creature. He needed to transform us from sin. And Paul, he tells us there in the fourth verse that God's great love for us, it did that. We'll see there in the fifth verse that Paul, he points out that the Lord loved us even when we were dead in trespasses against him. You see, many people, they, they believe that the Lord, that he doesn't love them because of their sins, their wrongdoings. They, they recognize that they live in wickedness, but because they live in wickedness, they, they truly believe that their sins are so great that the Lord doesn't love them. But Paul, he points to Christ to disprove such way of thinking. Let us remember what's said in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse by Jesus himself, who is God in the flesh. For God so loved the world. The world is, is talking about all people. The Lord loved the world and he gave the world his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. As I said in last week's Sunday school lesson, don't ever think that God does not love you. The Lord, he certainly does love you. Now we'll see there that Paul, he points out there in the fifth verse that the Lord, he made us alive together with Christ. So again, you and I, when we were living according to the way of the course of this world, when we were, when we were living in sin, you and I, we were dead in our soul. We were dead in our soul because of sin. Sin, I want you to understand, sin can't make anybody alive. I want you to understand when I say that, I'm talking about alive in our soul, alive in our spirit. There are many people today that, that live in wickedness. They feel that they are, are living a life of, of great happiness, a life of, of great joy. And while they may have happiness in this world, as you have heard me say in recent weeks, this world is not our home. We are merely passing through this world. There's a going to be a day where we are judged for how we chose to live in this world. And in that day of judgment, it will be determined how we will live in eternity. Will we live with the Lord for everlasting life or will we live apart from the Lord for, for everlasting life? You should, as you have heard me say before, you should desire to be with God for eternity. You should not desire to be separated from the Lord for eternity. Those who live set apart from the Lord for eternity, they will be dead in their soul. They will suffer what is known as the second death, that is the the spiritual death. Now, we'll see there even more in the fifth verse. Paul points out that we are saved by grace in that verse. And if we skip down to the eighth and the ninth verse there, we'll see that Paul mentions that it's not anything that we can do ourselves. 
to, to save our soul from the second death, from, from suffering the penalty of sin. Paul, he says there in that verse that it is the love of God that has made it possible to, to be saved in our souls. And see, many people, they often believe that all they need in order to be saved is to do good. I remember uh, growing up in nursery school, in daycare, hearing about you go to heaven if, you, if you're a good kid, if you, if you do good things, if you share. This, this concept, this thought, it, it plays on, on what James said that they're about faith, where James said that without works, your, your faith is dead. But James, I want you to understand, he was saying that one who is of sincere faith should have works. So in order for us to inherit the kingdom of heaven, we must believe. We must be of sincere faith. And again, when we are of sincere faith, the spirit resides in us with our spirit and we will be pushed, we will be urged, and we will desire to, to do good. We will desire to, to move for the Lord. We will produce the works of righteousness. Again, just going out and doing good and, and not having any faith in the only begotten Son of God, I want you to understand that that is not going to be reward, rewarded with, with salvation from the Lord. You must believe, you must have faith. Again, what is it that is said in the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse? It is said that whoever believes in the only begotten son will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Again, I want you to understand today that we have to be, we have to be very wary of that, that mechanical religion because that's what religion is. Religion is all about works, going out and, and having the good works. But again, the Lord, he doesn't desire that mechanical religion. The Lord, he desires genuine, sincere, pure faith. Now I wanna go back there to the sixth verse, where in the sixth verse, Paul, he speaks about why it is that we have been saved. We'll see, firstly, he tells us that we have been saved to be raised up and to sit together in the heavenly places. As I said throughout last year, the Lord, he truly desires for us to be with him. The Lord, he desires for, for mankind. He desires for all of us to, to, to dwell with him. That is why he gave the world his only begotten son in the first place. Again, to save us from sin so that we can dwell with him for eternity. We'll see there in the seventh verse that Paul, he states that the Lord desires to show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us. Now, I want to be very clear about what is said there in that seventh verse, so again, about the Lord desiring to, to show us the, the exceeding riches of, of his grace and, and kindness. I want to be very clear here that, that Paul was not talking about God showing us the riches of this world. In many of us, we, we, we put the riches over, of this world over everything. The, the riches of this world, they, they are truly great in the eyes of many. They grind and they hustle for the riches of this world over everything. But the Lord, he desires to give us better. Don't get me wrong, the, the, the world is a, a beautiful world and the riches of this world, they, they truly can bring about happiness. But again, the happiness that the riches of this world can, can give us is temporary. The Lord, he doesn't wanna give us temporary. You've heard me say that before, right? The Lord wants to give us eternal salvation, eternal joy, eternal peace, eternal contentment. This, I want you to understand what Paul says there in that seven verse, compared to everything else that we've read in our Sunday school lesson that we have gone over in our lesson so far today, it gives us the contrast between being the workmanship of God and being the workmanship of Satan. When you are the workmanship of Satan, you are dead in your soul. That's what Paul pointed out at the beginning of this lesson. 
But when you are the workmanship of the Lord, the Lord wants to give you the riches of his kingdom. Again, he wants to give you everlasting joy. Which do you think is better? Myself, I desire the riches of, of the kingdom of heaven. I desire to therefore then be the workmanship of God over being the workmanship of Satan that ends up with a soul that is dead. I again, urge you today, you be the workmanship of God because the workmanship of God is rewarded with a great reward, a reward that is greater than anything that we can find in this world. Paul, he says there in the 10th verse as our lesson begins to come to a close here, Paul says that we are his workmanship. He's talking about we, the sincere believer, being the workmanship of God. He says there, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There is no other way that you and I can become the workmanship of God without believing in Christ. Again, we must have faith in order for us to become holy and righteous. You cannot become holy and righteous any other way. Again, he says there in the 10th verse, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. For no other reason have we been created and made in Christ Jesus. For no other reason have we been born again. No other reason than for the good works, which Paul says, God prepare beforehand that we should walk in them. This gets us back to the topic of our Sunday school lesson last week where we talked about being predestined. God set all of this up beforehand. When, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, I want you to understand that the Lord had already desired for mankind to be holy and righteous. Again, he created us in his image and in his likeness. He created us to be holy and righteous. The Lord did not create us to be sinners. And so when we fell in the garden, the Lord already had everything ready to go to give his only begotten son who will become our propitiation. So that again, by faith, we can become holy and righteous in the eyes of God. I want you to understand today that all of us, we were created to uplift each other. The Lord said for us to, to prosper, to multiply, right? When, when, when he created mankind. God, I want you to understand, he did not create us to tear each other down. You've heard me say that a million times before as well. We are to be his workmanship. We are to be his workmanship to uplift each other. But sadly, so many of us, it seems, we desire to do nothing but to oppress one another. Sadly, it seems that so many of us, we, we desire to do nothing but to bring harm to each other. But again, I want you to understand today, God, he did not create us to oppress each other. He created us to love one another. We are to be his workmanship. Again, if you say that you are a believer, I want you to understand that you must live by faith. There's a great difference, and I said this in last week's lesson, and you're gonna hear this a lot this year as well, at least at the beginning of this year. There's a difference between the professed believer and the one who is of sincere faith. The professed believer will say that they believe, but the sincere believer will actually live by faith. Again, we must live by faith if we are God's workmanship. And again, if we are God's workmanship, when we live by faith, we will uplift all of those that are around us. So take that with you throughout this year. Be the workmanship of God uplift all of those that are around you. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Now, if you haven't done so already, I ask all of you to, to follow our channel. Be sure that you follow this channel so that you don't miss a Sunday School lesson, so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon or a food for thought. Be sure that you are following this channel today.